Vault monsters are a little difficult to describe as nothing per se directly defines what one is. In the simplest of terms, they are, as their name would imply, large monsters contained within the vaults themselves. But outside of that, no real correlation between many of them can be seen. Vault monsters can range from technology the Iridians created, to a guardian meant to protect what's inside the vault, to prisoners that were too dangerous to allow free in the universe that were locked inside, never meant to be released. The term vault monster is more of a simple nickname given to whatever behemoth it is that lies beyond a vault. But anyway, I feel we should start with possibly the single most dangerous being which threatened the entire universe as a whole, and the first one we ever saw, the Destroyer. Despite having never seen its true full form, it was a creature that was large enough to consume even the stars themselves. It drifted through the galaxy with no purpose or direction, always eating, always consuming. It didn't matter what it was that it devoured, it only ever destroyed. Countless planets, civilizations, and potentially even galaxies were lost to the Destroyer. Even its name is likely just one of many it's been known by, but no one has ever survived to tell the tale. The Destroyer. A practical name for an incomprehensible evil. Surely it has had millions of names more poetic or subtle. But none of the civilizations who coined them survived to pass them on, or anything else for that matter. Only the Destroyer itself knows for sure how long it has been tearing through the universe, eating its own name. It's even more frightening in this case because the Destroyer doesn't just consume, it becomes smarter from what it eats. All of the civilizations and planets that the Destroyer ate became part of its own intelligence. Only an even more intelligent race would be able to figure out how to outsmart and stop the Destroyer on its path. And this is where the Iridians come in. It's never detailed how they came to discover the Destroyer, because ever since its discovery, it's all they've ever cared about. It's theorized that the reason so many vault monsters exist is because the Iridians were always searching for these dangerous creatures in the universe that needed to be detained. It was an endless venture that would attempt to bring as much peace to the universe as possible, or something along those lines. The Destroyer just so happened to be both the most dangerous and final one they would try and stop. And so their plan, like any other, was forever trapping it inside of a prison. The greatest prison they would ever build, Pandora. An entire planet-sized cage built by generations upon generations of Iridian mines. The planet was its vault, and the moon was its key. The prison known as Pandora is the most incredible cage ever constructed. An unbreakable lock meant to hold an unceasing evil for all eternity. Even for the Iridians, whose reach could pluck stars from across the void, it was the work of centuries. The creation of Pandora took the minds of generations to assemble. It was an impossible task, the scope unthinkable, the cost of failure too great. Still, they worked diligently, even as stars in the sky above them began to wink out. And it was actually during the construction of Pandora that another vault monster would come to get created, the Warrior. Not all Iridians agreed with the decision to subdue and trap the Destroyer. Some looked at the beast as though it were a god, an inevitability that was destined to consume everything that stood in its path. In hopes to save their own souls, they worked in favor of the Destroyer, attempting to sabotage the construction and efforts being made with Pandora. And thus, as a response, the Warrior was created to protect the planet from all those who wish to do it harm. Always ready to be called upon to wipe out those who threaten Pandora's existence. Not all shared the desperate optimism of the Iridians. There were some who hoped to appease the Destroyer and save their own souls by attacking the yet unfinished Pandora. They were met by another of the Iridian's creations. The Warrior. Though their coup was obliterated, the Warrior now sleeps in its own vault, ready to defend it from any who would further trespass against Pandora. 
Due to the intelligence of the Destroyer, the Iridians used themselves as the bait to draw it in. Such an advanced species all grouped up in a single location, how could the Destroyer possibly ignore the feast that was awaiting it? But the Iridians had no intention of actually being consumed by the Destroyer, for if that were to happen, the intelligence it would gain from them would surely make it unstoppable. So they used a siren named Nereid, who was in possession of the Phase Leech, to leech every single one of their lives and use it to power their machine, which would trap the Destroyer inside the planet. And their plan worked flawlessly. At the cost of their entire species, the Destroyer was locked in Pandora, where it was meant to stay to the end of time. The momentous task of caging the Destroyer was made all the more difficult by its intelligence. It understands the beings it consumes, and the cultures it dissolves. To trick such a being required a great sacrifice, a lure. Millions of lives that entered Pandora ahead of its captive, tempting it further inward. I can only hope they were already dead when I closed the gate behind it." But even so, its power was so great that not even its cell would be able to withhold the full might and wrath of the Destroyer if it had the chance. So the Iridians had already devised a method to keep the monster quelled. Like any prisoner, they require food. So they implemented a system using a vault key and a lesser vault, which called upon travelers to open it every 200 years, only for them to be served as food to satiate the Destroyer's hunger. All prisoners must be fed, even the Destroyer. The Iridians devised of a feeding slot that calls wayward souls to open it every 200 years. A cruel surprise for those that open this false vault. But in exchange, the small morsel will keep the Destroyer sedate over the eons. In any case, the victims will not be in pain for long. At the end of Borderlands 1, the characters open its feeding cage and effectively push back part of its mouth. And following this event, Jack would steal its eyeball that it left behind and use it as a giant laser on the Helios space station. It's crazy to think that this was just a single eyeball that was near the mouth, and yet this type of destructive power is still able to be generated. It should put into perspective just how powerful the Destroyer in its true form could be. And in Borderlands 3, Pandora is opened. Tyrene wishes to absorb the Destroyer using her siren powers and ascend to godhood, which she does. However, by fusing herself with the Destroyer, she effectively lowered it to her level instead of ascending to its level. She was more than mortal and killed. As for the Destroyer, we don't quite know what becomes of it. It may very well have died alongside Tyrene, which, to be very honest, is an underwhelming way to go. On Pandora's moon, Elpis also existed a vault, and curiously, not too much is known about why this was here to begin with. Unlike other vaults which contained treasure troves of weapons and technology, inside of Elpis was only a single artifact. When touched, it gives visions of the future. From what we saw with Jack, everything that he saw came to pass exactly as was shown even though they were just glimpses, but almost as though it were inevitable. The same went for the Lost Legion as well. The Watcher had shown Colonel Zarpadon and her forces the relic, and they too saw the future. We don't know what exactly it is they saw, but whatever it was, was enough for them to try and destroy Elpis entirely. They didn't want anyone to get to its vault, likely specifically Jack, as his interaction with the relic sets him and everyone down a less than desired path. The Watcher also seems to have used this relic because it too is aware of some future it wishes to avoid. It's the same reason Lilith is so easily able to enter the vault and destroy the relic when she punches it into Jack's face. The Watcher was hoping that by allowing Lilith to do this, it may prevent the future it saw. And going off other videos I've made in the past, we've also learned that Sirens have free will and the ability to shape the course of history. The Watcher might have hoped that a Siren could change things in this moment by allowing her to do whatever she wanted. The Relic is also probably why it knows about this impending war it warns the characters about at the end of the pre-sequel. 
From all instances and implications, this relic seems to share visions of the future to a frightening accuracy. Why the Iridians had this and what they used it for, along with why they locked it on the moon of all places, are unknown. They might have always carried the relic around with them, which is how they discovered the monsters that were dangerous and needed to be trapped inside vaults. And the reason it's on Elpis is because that's where their final stand against the Destroyer was as well. Since this is where they were going to die, they just locked it on the moon inside of its own vault. The vault monster that would protect it was the Sentinel. Comparatively, this vault is much more heavily guarded than all of the other ones we know so far. There are not only numerous guardians, but different ranking ones as well. The Sentinel was an alright guardian, but definitely lacked any sort of reputation when compared to some of the others we know about. The Rampager might be the simplest of all the vault monsters to describe due to how little we actually know about it along with its circumstance. The vault is located on Promethea, and this planet is very significant to the world of Borderlands because it's where the very first vault was ever discovered. Typhon, while working under Atlas as a freelance explorer, so not as to be bullied out of the galaxy, stumbled upon the very first vault and uncovered it. We actually never get to see this vault. The Rampager's vault is a completely different one, at least so we think. So after quote unquote Atlas discovered the vault and kicked off the golden age of exploration and technology and vault hunting, they effectively took over the planet of Promethea as it was their claim to fame. They renovated the planet, began building all new structures and monuments to their company, showcasing to everyone that Promethea and Atlas should be known together. It's why I say the Rampager's vault likely wasn't the first vault. There'd be no reason for them not to put it on full display and have it underground. But after renovating the entire place and building their new city, it never occurred to them that there could be another vault residing on the planet. So the Rampager's vault was buried over, built upon. The new city sat right above another vault and they had no idea it was ever there. That was until the company went under and Reese took control as its new CEO. Now, with all of the former resources Atlas had back then, he sort of just found it. It's pretty simple, there's no grander explanation other than that. He kept its existence a secret because an unopened vault can very easily mean trouble in many ways, and a newly revived company didn't need the hassle it would bring. The old Atlas Corporation just paved right over it. I found it when I took over, but I wasn't about to pop the top on that thing in a populated area. Opening a vault is messy stuff. Outside of that, the Rampager is just a mystery. We know nothing about it or what it was capable of. It might have just been a very aggressive monster constantly rampaging cities, so the Iridians locked it away. Our next vault monster is located on Eden 6, home of the Jacobs Corporation family, and the relevance here would actually be very important. The Jacobs initially came to this planet by complete accident. Their ship was pulled down into the planet's orbit, where they crash landed on the surface, where they discovered all of the wondrous resources that would later be used to craft their firearms. As they would later learn, it was the vault itself that was pulling people to the planet and causing them to crash, but they weren't aware of that just yet. Fortunately, the Jacobs were largely alone on this planet, giving them ample time to explore the area and uncover all of its secrets. They built their company, their home, everything the corporation needed to be successful. But it's not until Montgomery Jacobs was in control of everything where he found the planet's vault. Now initially they had no idea what it was and thus never opened it, but fortunately they wouldn't have to wait long because it was around this same time when Typhon uncovered the very first vault and kicked off the age of vault hunting. This was both a blessing and a curse to the Jacobs family. On the upside, they knew what the vault that was on their planet was. But on the downside, mega corporations were paying top dollar and willing to do anything and resort to any dirty tactic to get their hands on a vault, and the Jacobs didn't want any part of this upcoming mega corporate war. 
so the Jacobs family buried it. They built an entire system around it and hid it in plain sight, integrating it as part of their home. Knowledge of this was only ever permitted to be passed down to the other Jacobs. To really cement and shoo away any suspicion other corporations might have about the planet, Montgomery hired Typhon de Leon to find the vault. This was all pretty much his fault anyway, and with a reputation like his, he was the perfect man for the job. Typhon spent a lot of time on Eden 6 with Montgomery, his wife, and even his child. They became pretty decent friends throughout it all, and Typhon was having a more than rough time finding a vault he didn't know existed. He searched pretty much the entire planet from front to back and nothing turned up. Then the revelation hit him that the only place he hadn't searched was the Jacob's own home or near it. He hit the nail on the head and found the vault, but Montgomery told him to keep it a secret, tell everyone that there was no vault on the planet, and Typhon complied. He had no real allegiance to any mega corporation, and he was more than happy to have just been able to find the vault. So he kept it hidden, and Eden 6 was left alone for quite some time. That was until Borderlands 3. When the Jacobs Corporation finds themselves being in trouble of being overthrown by Aurelia, Wainwright divulges his family's secret to the Vault Hunters as thanks for helping save the company. What's interesting about the Grave Ward is that the monster isn't even inside of the vault at all. It's a collection of branches and trees that reside around the vault. But even more interesting than that are the guardians that protect the vault are named Grave and Ward, respectively. It's only once they're killed that it looks like their souls transfer into the tree, which becomes the Grave Ward. Classifying this as a vault monster might actually be very unfitting. It seems like this was more of just a monster that was at the vault. But the story does treat it as though it is a vault monster. Tyreen wants to leech it for power, but after we kill it, Tannis gets rid of its life force altogether so no one can use it. The Traveler is a very unique vault monster indeed. As its name would imply, this vault was always moving, never staying in one place for all too long before disappearing elsewhere. While we do find it on Pandora, I think the more logical answer regarding this vault is that it just so happened to be on Pandora at the time of its opening. Convenient, I know, but there's not much of a reason a vault like this would need to exist on the planet in the first place. In fact, why the Iridians would have needed to build a teleporting vault in the first place is also very questionable. That may be more due to the Traveler itself. The vault wasn't teleporting, the monster within it was, and as a side effect, the vault was always moving with it. We see that the Traveler, despite its large size, can teleport from location to location and it does so multiple times when engaged in battle. Whether or not this vault monster was yet another creation of the Iridians can be up for debate. On one hand, it seemed to be able to freely leave its vault with relative ease compared to some of the more aggressive prisoners looking to break free. Plus, guardians also reside inside the stomach of the monster for some reason. Even the game thinks it's kind of weird. Of course, guardians are just there to protect things. It's not an indication of whether or not a vault monster is technology. What usually helps reveal that answer is what was inside of the vault. If it was just a monster and some guns, then chances are it was mainly a prison. But if there's just a vault monster or a really powerful relic, then chances are the Iridians were protecting something for a reason. And to this day, we still don't fully know what was inside that vault. Maybe we'll get some answers in Tales from the Borderlands 2, which was recently announced. But for now, it's not all too important. What is impressive is how the Traveler was caught. Atlas, before Reese took control of it during their time on Pandora, had hit a bit of a dry run ever since uncovering the first vault. They hadn't quite reached the successes they were hoping for, and the resources that they were spending on Pandora were becoming too much of a waste. By the way, it sounds they did stumble upon the Traveler's Vault, which like I said was likely on Pandora by pure coincidence, but they were never able to catch up to it. It was always teleporting, never able to be entered, or when they got close, the Traveler came out and prevented them from ever getting close. 
There were two problems at hand they figured they needed to solve. First was getting the vault to stop teleporting, and second was dealing with the vault monster. Their solution, as would be described, was a last ditch effort, a Hail Mary hoping for only the best with a small glimmer of hope. And thus, the Gordis Project was created. It's never gone into too much detail about the specifics, but what we need to know is that they had miraculously figured out a way to summon the Traveler's Vault to their location using a beacon on Gordis. Gordis was also meant to fight the Traveler, morphing into a large combat robot in hopes to defeat it. There was no specific branch of Atlas responsible for the creation of Gordis, so scientists and engineers across Pandora collectively worked on its creation, however was cut short when Athena went on a revenge killing spree against all those who worked for the company. Gordis was finished and created, but all the parts which completed it were scattered, and in Tales from the Borderlands, the characters do assemble Gordis, summon the Vault, and the Traveler, and actually manage to defeat it, while Reese and Fiona claimed its treasure. Far, far within the depths of space is the mysterious Lovecraftian world of Xylorgos, and on the surface of that planet lie the corpse of the single largest Vault monster we've seen to date. The Eater of Hearts. Githian is its name, and it is unknown how it managed to break free from its vault. By the time we as the player arrive on the planet, it's already a corpse. But it can likely be presumed that Dahl were the ones responsible for killing him, as lackluster as that may sound. A log can be seen of the very first day exploring the planet where Githian is alive. It's the only image we ever get to see where he's alive and theoretically moving around. As weird as it may sound, this could have also possibly even been further in the past before Vincent and Eleanor's exploration team, also working for Dahl, arrived on the planet. In their Day One log, they explicitly state that Githian's body is dead. Research log Day One. My name is Eleanor Olmsted. My beloved and I have arrived on the rim world of Xylorgos. We have finally found the beast of legend after years of chasing its name across the stars. Githian. Supposedly it means eater of hearts, but the original language is dead and lost to time. A charming introduction as ever, Vincent, my love. Githian's physiology can only be described as otherworldly. Though its body is dead, its heart still beats. This requires further study. While in the picture, it appears to be very much alive. It is possible that another doll team had arrived on this planet and encountered him where they were the ones who killed him, but that doesn't much explain why they would have also died and left their research behind in pictures as Eleanor's team sound like they were attempting to specifically track down Githian, which is what led them to Xylorgos. If another doll team had been there, you'd expect at least some kind of mention. A little inconsistency there from my perspective, but while Githian's body may be unable to move, it wasn't killed as its heart still beats. While not much of a life is able to be lived from only a heartbeat, it didn't stop his influence from corrupting the people who began moving to the planet. Eleanor and Vincent's research team were the first to experience its effects firsthand. Githian's abilities are quite unique. It's easy to wrap your head around what some of these monsters are capable of, as it's typically a single gimmick, so to speak. The Destroyer destroys everything in its path, the Warrior protects Pandora, the Traveler teleports, and so on. Githian is described as the Eater of Hearts, and thus he is able to sway the hearts of man so it can consume people's humanity. But doubly, he also grants eternal life. He corrupts and sways people to trade their humanity in exchange for an ageless existence. However, that may be something more specific to him and nothing to do with being a vault monster. His lifespan may very well be that of an ageless one, never capable of dying but still immortal in the sense that it could be killed. I say this because he might not have actually been organic at all. On day 37 of Eleanor and Vincent's research, they uncovered the Iridian ruins near where Githian's vault likely was, and found a direct connection between Githian and the Iridian technology. 
If Githian really was just an organic being the Iridians discovered and locked inside one of their vaults for being too dangerous, then there should be no real reason that they share a technological connection. But anyway, when more and more people began moving to the planet, they began constructing a town under and around Githian's corpse, using its body as structural integrity. But being in such close proximity to a vault monster, especially one who wasn't actually dead, for such a prolonged period of time, the residents of Cursehaven began to develop, well, curses. None were quite the same, and they each seemed to affect everyone differently. We know these curses are due to Githian's radiation, because certain tribes like Aistas live far out in the mountains away from the corpse, and they aren't affected at all. For the most part, Githian in its state is a very passive vault monster. Despite what you may expect, he doesn't do much proactively. Yes, people did get corrupted, the townsfolk developed curses, but that's because they came to him. Even the bonded aren't his doing. Eleanor developed a cult to worship Githian because she needs vessels for her husband, who accidentally became infused within Githian's heart. Githian's more so existing, and its radiation from still being alive is pushing others to act and change. He really is mostly a corpse lying there, barely kept alive by a heartbeat. But, like all vault monsters, Eleanor and Vincent's plan to become reunited fails, and the vault hunters kill them, which results in the destruction of Githian's heart as well. If he really was Iridian technology, then what was the purpose of eating hearts? Necrotefeo was one of the Iridians' homeworlds whilst they were presumably perusing the universe, and the vault monster on this planet is one of the more unique creatures that we lay our eyes on. The vault contained a giant serpent, which when released, bore its way through the earth of the planet. Unfortunately for the creature, it was met by Typhon de Leon. His own journeys with his wife led him here, and while he doesn't seem like the monster-slaying type, he certainly seemed to handle himself quite well against the serpent. While its corpse lay sprawled out over the very vault it emerged from, what makes this vault monster interesting is that it may not have always been a vault monster to begin with. Remember Nereid, who helped imprison the Destroyer alongside the Iridians? Well, after she wiped out their entire race and completed her job, she thought her powers were far too dangerous to let keep existing, so she had taken a gamble. She locked herself inside the vault on Necrotefeo in hopes that her power would never make their way into the normal world again. And you know what? She was right. Her powers never found a new host until the vault was opened again many, many centuries in the future. And when that vault opened, from it emerged a vault monster. No signs of Nereid's old, decrepit body, or any hint that this was someone's final resting place, just another monstrosity lashing out at everything the moment it was freed. Perhaps these vault monsters were never the hideous beasts that came out when they went in with a few exceptions being the ones that were created. Any of these prisoners could have been as normal-sized and human as the rest of us, but the mutagenic dimension they were trapped in warped their minds and appearances into what we know and associate with vault monsters. Something to think about. But anyway guys, those were the vault monsters that we know so far. There are undoubtedly countless others that still exist, and some whose names we are even aware of. The Timekeeper is one that we know exists and I didn't cover, however, we only know its name and nothing else. We can assume the implications of the name Timekeeper to be as direct as all of the others, but that is only speculation for now and this isn't the video to do that. Anyway, thank you guys for watching. For more Borderlands lore videos, be sure to subscribe to my channel as I often talk about it, and if there are any other lore videos you'd like to see, then let me know in the comments below, and until next time, I'll see you in the next video.